It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the indescribable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing this morning, John? Excellent. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. We're a little off our schedule, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can, you know, we could let, let the curtain fall and let, and, you know, let the, our viewers in, our, our the teeming multitudes who love the Hero Show, let them in on the production here because Friday is a Christmas Day, so we're pre-recording on Wednesday, a little bit off our, our schedule. But, you know, we have somebody scheduled this week who is so great that we, you know, we the show must go on, you know, for for, for this character, right? Our first fictional hero who are we gonna who are we gonna immortalize this morning john sherlock holmes the detective of 221 b baker street baker street excuse me the greatest of all the fictional detectives you know i think you and i are both detective story fans right and and you know there are other fictional detectives i love notably nero wolf but Sherlock Holmes, to me, you know, just towers over, over the landscape. The first, the greatest, the winner and still champion, the all-time great detective, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he is, he's a phenomenon. You know, he's more than a literary character. He's a phenomenon. Absolutely. He's sort of the cause of his whole culture of fandom. You know, people have, so, they so resonate with his character that they, form groups just to immortalize him and you know he's been a, a literary symbol of the rational mind now for 133 years he's the first ever consulting detective or at least he calls himself that he wasn't the first detective story in history but one of and i was amazed to find that uh you know by the 1990s somebody had done a count and found that there had been some 25,000 different appearances of sherlock holmes and various uh, movies, TV shows, stage plays, books, uh, and articles. And so he's, he's named the most portrayed human character of, of literature of all time. Wow. Wow. Yeah, there's all kinds of things we could say about that. One, of course, like, like you said, um, there, there are societies dedicated to Sherlock Holmes uh, studies, and they they know every. Some of these are, got, people are such experts. I mean, they're amateurs, but they're they're such experts. They know every piece of of, Sher, of Sherlockian, you know, Sherlockian ar arcana, you know, from from every story. And and some of the some of the most amusing uh, things they focus on are the cases that Dr. Watson mentions that he never wrote about. The, that hmm. was the year of the giant rat of Sumatra, you know, and you know, things, you know, things like that really, you know, really catch your attention. I was like, wow, too bad Conan Doyle never wrote, you know, those stories. And so, you know, like every, every piece of, of information, you know, relevant to, to Holmes mania. But the second thing is, uh, you know, sign of um, his staying power in, in the culture is how many pastiches are written uh, about Sherlock Holmes, you know, you know, stories, uh, a pastiche, a story by some author other than than the original author. Uh, you know, and there's there's like hundreds of them. Uh, there's there's a series out now about the daughter of Sherlock Holmes. You know, and and, and I, it's just it really shows the endless fascination of the literary world with this character. And Sister, other, right? Yeah, Enola, right? Enola Holmes. Well, that's his. Yeah, that's that's the story about. Uh, Sherlock Holmes' sister, yeah, the, yeah, his younger sister, the younger sister, Enola, the younger sister, Mycroft, and Sherlock. But there's a whole series of books about the daughter of Sherlock Holmes, Joanna, Joanna Blaylock. Uh, and anybody who knows the, uh, the Holmes corpus knows there's only one woman who could possibly be Joanna Blaylock's mother. And that was, of course, was Irene Adler who outsmarted Holmes in- uh, The woman. Yeah, the woman, <laughs> right, the, the woman in, in A Scandal in Bohemia. And the author of this, the, this series of, you know, 
about Holmes's daughter says it was a was a one night assignation between you know Holmes and and uh, uh, Irene Adler and, and so, so anyway you know the daughter of Sherlock Holmes and Irene Adler has a few has a few brains right a few gray cells to quote another great detective I, I, Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot uh, you know so it's endless fascination uh, I've read a bunch of pastiches. Um, some of them are pretty good, but you know, I I, I would never, never write a, write a Sherlock Holmes story. You can't. It'd be like trying to write to the Fountainhead, you know. And I I think I could write a good, a good story about Howard Roth, but it would pay. It could listen to the matter, you know. So, but the fascination is such that these endless books are written, you know, um, by different authors about further adventure Sherlock Holmes the literary world. It's this uh, one last example. I was at Barnes Noble, uh, you know, in the New York area a few months ago, and, and, and you know, all these the, the mystery section is filled, you know, by author, you know. So here's you know, here's your Raymond Chandler's books, and here's you know, uh, Rex Stout's books, and so on and so forth. Sherlock Holmes had his own section. It wasn't even Arthur Conan Doyle. It was just Sherlock Holmes. Was named the character, not, not the author. This is how, it's how famous yeah, literary immortal Holmes is. Yeah, I, I, I second that. I don't see how anyone could take it upon themselves to further Arthur Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle's legacy. I mean, he was just such a brilliant writer. Uh, you know, we we're talking about him going to medical school and training to become a doctor. And, and that's, of course, where inspiration struck for Sherlock Holmes is Edinburgh professor Joseph Bell. And, um, you know, he tried to be a doctor for a while. He opened a few medical offices, Arthur Conan Doyle did, or, and um, it didn't work out. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't getting clients, but instead he was sitting at his desk in his medical office and writing these incredible stories. And, of course, uh, as you pointed out, the, the world has plenty of capable doctors, but there's only one Sherlock. And, and so we have to, you know, we have to thank Conan Doyle for not pursuing his medical career too, too voraciously and, um, and giving us, gifting us this incredible literary gift. Yeah, absolutely. It's possible. You know, tr Sherlock Holmes, before we get into some of the specific tales, which is just great. A lot of, a lot of this is so imaginative. It's great stuff. Sherlock Holmes transcends genre fiction. I mean, he's a, he's a, a fictional detective, so you'll find him in the mystery section or the, you know, the detective story section. But as a character, he transcends genre fiction. He's, he may be the most distinct, we call him, the headline, singular. Singular. <laughs> singular. One of author favorite adjectives if you go through uh if viewers of the show go through the corpus of Sherlock Holmes story you'll see how many times Arthur Conan Doyle uses that as an adjective so I think he would he would approve of us applying it to his character Sherlock Holmes may be the most singular character in all of literature all all, all genres all genres combined he's so distinctive he's so brilliantly etched you know as 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 a character and um, one, of, one of the things of many that I always loved about Sherlock Holmes from the time I was a little kid is that he's an, an intellectual hero. I mean, he, he's always, in any story, he's always the smartest guy in the room. I mean, Irene Adler outsmarts him that one time. You know, if they were in 100 cases together, how many times would she outsmart him? There's no, there's no way to know, probably, you know, Probably ninety times out of a hundred or more, he wins the you know the contest of wits, even with the even with the brilliant and wily uh, Irene Adler. Yeah, he's he's just he's always the smartest guy in the room, and it, it you know it, and and I love the way Arthur Conan Doyle celebrates his intelligence. He's a tough guy. He's a boxer. You know, he's a he's an accomplished boxer. He's he's got tremendous strength in that wiry frame. He's He's inexhaustible when he's in pursuit of some some criminal. He's good with a revolver. He uses it a number of times in 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 the stories. But you know, overall, it's his genius that makes him who he is. And that's what I, one thing of many I love about Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, and in, in the pantheon of heroes, there aren't too many that are really defined by their reasoning mind. You know, there's 
They're heroes that are defined by their perseverance, a la Shackleton or Thomas Edison in creating the light bulb. There are heroes that are defined by their courage, like Washington, you know, if we're crossing out uh, both uh, real life heroes and literary heroes, you know, Washington or, or Frodo Baggins for a literary hero, it's extreme courage. And then you're, you have literary heroes that are known for their independence um, or, or just heroes in general, like the Wrights who we talked about last week, the Wright brothers or Howard Rourke. But in terms of heroes who are just defined by their reasoning prowess to use an Andyism, uh, you know, Sherlock really stands alone. There are a few characters that I think have been modeled after Sherlock to some extent that one could say uh, are, are defined by their reasoning mind. One of them I think we'll talk about a little bit is House MD. I don't know if you saw that popular television show. Mm. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Me yeah, too. House is commonly referred to as the Sherlock of medicine. And, um, but you know, there, he, you're right. He stands, uh, he, he just stands above all of these other heroes in, in his defining characteristic of being a symbol of the reasoning mind. And you know, absolutely right. Reasoning prowess. I like that. It's an Andyism. Oh, right, well, I gift it freely to the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, and it's almost like a rite of passage or something for, uh, subsequent, writers of soft-boiled detective fiction, you know, who are writing about these brilliant guys, uh, Nero Wolf, you know, you know the, Rex, the great Rex Dow creation, and of course, Hercule Poirot, uh, Agatha Christie's primary detective. It, they, they, they credit Sherlock Holmes. I, I'm, you know, I've read so many of these stories, they kind of, over the years, they kind of blur together in my mind. But I believe that Nero Wolf has a portrait of Sherlock Holmes on, on, on his wall. I think Archie Goodwin mentioned, I love Archie Goodwin in the, in the Nero Wolf series. I think Archie mentions that, you know, uh, on one occasion. And I know that Hercule Poirot mentioned Sherlock Holmes respectfully, you know, uh, in, in, in dialogue. So, you know, you, you know, the, 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 the follow, the following writer, the great writers of, about these geniuses, the Nero Wolf, Hercule Poirot types, pay homage to Sherlock Holmes as, you know, the, the first, the, the, the groundbreaking trailblazer and this giant of brilliant detect, detective fiction who's characterized, you know, there are some, there are some, there are some brawls and fights. And, you know, when we get to Dr. Watson, you know, soon, there are times when Sherlock Holmes says to him, he says, Watson, he says, there's danger, you know, bring your revolver. You know, and so there, 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 there are there are tough guy brawls and stuff in the Sherlock Holmes series. But what's so distinctive is him pacing his room all night. Watson says, working the case in his mind, his you know his his genius, figuring out, seeing the things that other people don't see, you know, getting uh, seeing where the clues point to, you know, doing doing his deductions as uh, as uh, Conan Doyle describes it. His genius is what is what makes him special. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, there are some, some characters like you mentioned, but, and there were a few that preceded Sherlock Holmes. I think we should mention um, Edgar Allan Poe's Auguste Dupin mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the Monsieur Lecoq, uh, oh, yeah. a couple detectives that preceded Sherlock Holmes. And it's funny that, um, that, uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle actually works mention of both of these into the very first Sherlock Holmes story and Sherlock Holmes is sort of dismissive of, of them. And it's funny because he, he really does refine this detective types to such a, to a high degree that he just is, uh, you, you, we no longer think of, of uh, Poe's character or Monsieur Lecoq. We think of Sherlock Holmes as the one detective to rule them all. I like, like, that. I like that. Nice phrase. One detective to rule them all. Exactly. Exactly right. Um, so we, we should, we would be remiss if we didn't discuss some of the singular cases, you know, of, uh, of Sherlock Holmes and his good buddy, uh, Dr. John Watson. Um, Sherlock, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle has a, uh, obviously has an outstanding imagination and, um, very good plot structures, you, you know. Um, we if if we if we analyze the the stories, I think you know the, of these great detective writers. I think we have to give first place regarding plot 
to Agatha Christie. She, she is just an amazing plot writer and she does it over and over and over again. And it's just jaw dropping what a great plot writer is. She's like the Victor Hugo of, uh, you know, of, the, of detective fiction. But Hercule Poirot pales in comparison to Sherlock Holmes. She doesn't tower over the landscape the way Sherlock Holmes does, which is why me as a hero worshiper, I always, as, as, as much as I admire Agatha Christie as a plot writer, I prefer reading the Sherlock Holmes stories. They're well plotted, not at Agatha Christie's level, nobody is, uh, but they're well plotted and they have Sherlock Holmes. They have this gigantic towering uh, hero. And, and, and Conan Doyle has a, re a really good imagination. The Hound of the Baskervilles, you know, <laughs> you, you, you know, you know, is, is some, is some of his, uh, the, the, uh, the speckled band, you remember where, where the, the doctor is using this venomous snake to kill his, his, his daughters, no, no less, or, or, or his, his, his victims. You know, the snake comes through the air shaft and down the, you know, down the, what do you call it, the, the pole or the, you know, the cord that you, you know. Servant bell or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, there's very imaginative stories here. That's brilliant stuff. Any, anyone in particular that you want to start with? I, I know a study in Scarlet uh, is the first show that comes story. We, we, we could start there or whatever. What's, what's your, what's your pick, John? Yeah, I love a study in Scarlet. Why don't, why don't we discuss that? Sure. It being the first, it seems appropriate. Definitely, definitely, and and um, this is where this yeah this is the first this is where uh, Doctor Watson first meets Sherlock Holmes because he needs he needs a roommate right, um, and we should mention uh, we have to mention Doctor Watson because he's recently returned from the wars in the, in Afghanistan, British Army doctor brave brave man, and he's been seriously wounded. And he's uh, he's discharged from the service, and he's back in in Britain, uh, rehabilitating. Uh, various Sherlock Holmes scholars and experts point out that Arthur Conan Doyle wasn't consistent as to where <laughs> Doctor Watson's wound was, and in different stories, there was his knee or his shoulder. <laughs> um, uh, but but wherever. Uh, Watson's wounded. He, he he's rehabilitating. He he's living on his army pension. He needs a roommate. A friend of his introduces him. A mutual friend introduces him to Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Have you read a study in Scarlet recently? Do you remember Watson's ori original take on the uh, on Sherlock Holmes? Yeah, I just read it, and um, I recall they meet in the laboratory, and he's right. he's unsure what to think of of Holmes at first, but I think he's. Uh, you know, he's Sherlock has just refined this reagent for hemoglobin, right? I, yeah, I, referring to. I, yeah, I remember. I remember he was in the laboratory and he was he was working on 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 some chemical problem. I don't remember. I don't remember the the details. But what I, what did I remember from a uh, study in Scarlet? You know, and their their first meeting was uh, <laughs> Watson. You know, is is. is fascinated by this character you 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 everybody everybody is and he has so he watson makes a checklist doesn't he of like the, the things that sherlock uh, of mm. the, the extent of sherlock holmes's knowledge <laughs> and he like, doesn't know the first thing doesn't know the first thing about astronomy was he doesn't know the planets yeah. revolve around the sun I think. literature uh, nil philosophy <laughs> nil astronomy doesn't know that the, yeah he doesn't know that the sun is the center of the universe and when he does know it he wants to forget it as soon as possible <laughs> right because it clutters up his his mind with things that for him for knowledge that for him is is useless <laughs> but lurid crime stories you know he's he's like omniscient he knows he knows every crime story that goes back like you know like like centuries and chemistry of course he knows a, a great a great deal of about yeah so so watson is is fascinated by this character and they and they 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 move in they move in together and of course as as uh de rigueur for this kind of a story there are some vivid murders that are that are taking place in in london at this time and uh lestrade is was lestrade the detective in the study of scarlet I, I forget there's a series of scotland yard yeah actually both lestrade and um the other character, what's his Gregson? name? Was it Gregson? Yes, Gregson. Yeah, because there's a series of Scotland Yard detectives that you know, uh, come in and out of the Sherlock Holmes corpus. 
and they, you know, they usually uh, are respectful uh, of Holmes, or they, they regard him as as, as un, unconventional. But I remember the, you know, the, the the scene of the of the first murder is in a deserted house in London, and the murderer had had used blood, you know, to write on the wall "Rach," you know, R A C H E. And so the Scotland Yard guys figured that oh he was he was writing Rachel and they were they would go off looking for for some Rachel as a, as a possible murderer, and and when Holmes does does his inspection, do you, remember, do you remember his parting shot to the detectives as he's as he's leaving the as he's leaving the house? Do you remember what he says then? I recall that he says if you're looking for someone named Rachel, you're on on the wrong track. Yeah, he says that Rach uh, in German means revenge. Yeah. So yeah, so he knows he knows that this is uh that this is a, a revenge uh story or, or a revenge tale. And eventually I I, I mean Arthur Conan Doyle did his homework because it goes this is in London, eighteen eighty something, whatever, you know, whatever whatever year this is. But this this story goes back like forty years, you know, to the in Utah, you know, to the American West and the uh, uh, the Mormons and the, you know and their founding of Salt Lake City. And Arthur Conan Doyle is obviously not a fan of Mormonism, is he? <laughs> yeah, he, he takes a shot at religion in this story, which is uh, and specifically at Mormonism, just depicting at how cruel and barbaric they were and and how backwards they were in many of their beliefs. I mean, we learn about Jefferson Hope and, um, you know, his, his uh, Sally Ferrier and John Ferrier being picked up by the Mormons, almost dead, dying in the desert on their way. Uh, and um, the uh, Mormons pick them up and assimilate them into their, their lives. But then they are, uh, John Ferrier is told that he has to take on a, a, a harem, right? Or else he's going to be uh, shunned. And he, he refuses for a long time. But when it comes time for his daughter to be uh, married off, he wants her to be married to a, a, a Christian and not be part of some, uh, you know, multi wife family. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, when I, when I recall, recall, uh, the Mormons, with the little girl, she was a little girl that I was name was her name Lucy. What was what Lucy was Ferrier? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah Lucy. Uh, they the Mormons the Mormons stipulate that in, in, in order for them to save him and not leave him die in the desert, he's got to he's got to convert to their religion. Wasn't that part of the exactly? Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, nice. Otherwise, they're going to leave him there to die. You know what? Yeah, you know, what nice guys they are. You know. And by the way, I you know I did a little bit of research years ago when I first read this story and uh, back when I was using the Encyclopedia Botanica, it was so far back, it was before the internet, you know, <laughs> although I don't, you know, the Encyclopedia Botanica is a great thing. I'm, I'm all in, in favor of it. But um, yeah, the Mormon, the Mormons were a violent, brutal set. They, they had terrible violence done to them by their enemies. And then they were, they were terribly violent and brutal to, uh, to their enemies. So Arthur Conan Doyle uh, has this right. And uh, and Lucy grows up to be you know this beautiful uh, young woman, and she falls in love with Jefferson Hope, who's a dashing kind of cowboy, uh, you know, you know, good-looking, heroic guy. Uh, but the but you know he's not a Mormon, and the Mormons are request she's got to marry a, a Mormon. So they they try to escape, and it's uh, they're uh, the, the the three of them. I want you know. Do you remember what happens uh, to the family? Yeah, it's very sad. Uh, John Ferry, they, they, so um, Jefferson Hope goes off to find some food because they've been traveling for days and days. He finally does, but then he can't find his way back to the farriers. And when he finally makes his way back to the camp, he finds a grave where Jefferson ha, or John has uh, recently been buried and Lucy has been taken away. And he vows then and there that uh, if he cannot have lucy he will have revenge right right and it's a years long uh crusade for jefferson for jefferson hope uh the mormons murdered 
John Ferrier, who, you know, in his youth had been a rough dude, as they say in my native Brooklyn, uh, but by this time was, you know, was, was, was elderly. Uh, Lucy, beautiful young woman, she's married off to what, uh, one of these Mormon guys were kind of swinish. They, they, they depicted as kind of, you know, kind of piggish. Now, she dies young of a broken heart, right? Uh, dies under- within a month of being married to uh, Dreber. A month. Yeah. Wow. Well, what is she like? She's like 20, 21, some, something like that. She dies of a broken heart, which you can understand. Her father's just been murdered right in front of her eyes. Uh, the man she loves, she's forcibly separated from. She's married to some somebody who's piggish in his ways, so who she detests and forced to live, you know, in this barbaric religion that she, that she does not uh, accept. So death is a way out for, for Lucy Ferrier. And of course, Jefferson Hope stalks these guys for years. You know, uh, you know he, I think he comes close to them in Cleveland or, or they were in, in New York and they sail to London. I don't know if they think they're going to get him off their track, but they don't. And he finally catches up to them in, in London and the two of them, right? And he, uh, and he, he, he murders both of them. And well, you know, not at the same time, but in different, in different incidents. And, the, you know, the, the conventional police, the Scotland Yard guys are baffled by this. But Sherlock Holmes, of course, figures out, you know, figures out the, the story, figures out what's going on. And then he's the one who nabs uh, Jefferson Hope. I don't remember the steps. Do you remember the steps by, by means of which the clues that Holmes uses to, to uh, uh, solve the case when the Scotland Yard guys couldn't? I don't remember, I don't remember the step by step or any, any of the clues. Well, I know that he goes and interviews the uh, policeman who was on duty in that area that night and who actually discovered the body. And he quickly learns that, uh, well, the, the policeman let the murderer go. The murderer, Jefferson Hope, we know at this point, uh, was there and acting very drunk and was let off. And so he gets a physical description of him, which he he needs to some extent, but he doesn't learn too much from that because he learns so much from the crime scene. His powers of observation are incredible. He can, he can look at the ground and say, okay, he's looking at the footprints in the mud right. and he knows how tall this guy is. And he, he verifies that by seeing how high on the wall he wrote Rosh, revenge in German, as we said. Right. Um, and uh, he, he also, uh, when they move the body, they find the ring. And so he puts together, okay, there's, there's a woman involved. So Rosh, revenge, this makes sense. Yeah, that's what, that's what Jefferson Hope had come back for to the crime scene because he had dropped the ring, right? And that's how he had, the cop was, he had to pretend to be a, a drunk. But it was the ring that 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 he was after, right? And 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 was it Sherlock Holmes? Was was he was working as a? Was he was he was he driving a cab? Jefferson Hope was driving a cab. Yeah. And 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 Sherlock Holmes figured out it was him, and he got he got that cab, you know, to come to his apartment for for some reason with the Scotland Yard guys there. And then when he you know he when Jefferson Hope unsuspecting was reaching down for something, Holmes clapped the handcuffs on him. Right, and I think they all, and Jefferson Hope put up this. He, he's a he, he's a tough guy. He put up this tremendous struggle. It took like all all four of them. You know, Holmes, Watson, and the you know, and the two Scotland Yard guys. Even though Jefferson Hope was handcuffed, it took all four of them to finally subdue him. Yeah, and when they do, Jefferson Hope, there's this really interesting scene where he says, you know, you can you can untie my legs, and I'll walk down to my cab on my own two feet. I'm I'm pretty heavy. You're not going to have an easy time carrying me. And both Gregson and Lestrade are like, well, yeah, right. This is sort of a, a bold proposition. But Holmes immediately unties his legs. And I think this is an interesting little fact about Sherlock that, you know, he's often, and even in, uh, even in Arthur Conan Doyle's own words, he's often considered to be this cold, calculating machine who's anti-emotion uh, to some extent. But, you know, he obviously understands uh, emotional intelligence. He has a high degree of emotional intelligence. He can read people. He commonly uses little psychological clues. He he can observe body language and know a lot more about the average person than, than you or I. So he's, he's, he understands that Jefferson hope he, he knows just by 
the circumstances and, and by observing him that this is not a guy who's about to run from us. He, he's actually giving us his word. Right. And Jefferson Hope has just perpetrated two murders, but he's not a villain. You know, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's in fact, you know, his, his revenge is justified. He's more of a hero than, than he, he, he is a villain. I, in, in my, in my judgment, he, he uh, killed these two killers, these two cold blooded murderers of Lucy's, uh, they, they murdered John Ferrier and for all, uh, you know, all intents and purposes, they murdered Lucy too, by, you know, by, by breaking her heart. So Jefferson mm-hmm. Hope is, is not a villain. And I think, Sherlock Holmes recognizes that there are, there are some characters in the Sherlock Holmes corpus who are, you know, who are really dangerous guys who are really, I mean, Jefferson Hope was dangerous to his enemies, not dangerous to, to innocent people. But, you know, there, there are some really bad guys who uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes recognizes are dangerous and would never, would never, you know, untie his legs like, like he does, he does uh, in, in the case of, of Jefferson Hope. It's a shame that Hope gives his entire, the, the entire rest of his life to just seeking revenge because, of course, that's not a very, uh, that's not a life well lived. But he does get justice in the end, and, and you're absolutely right. He's not a villain in the sense that we consider most murderers to be villains. He's, he's getting justice, and right. this is very clear in the story. Right. Yes. Yes, it is. It's, it's, that's exactly right. And it shows up. It showcases, you know, a study in Scarlet showcases uh, Sherlock Holmes' genius for the first time. And from there, the, the next Sherlock Holmes story was The Sign of Four, right? Was that, was that, have you read, have you reread that one recently? Yeah, The Sign of the Four. I've, I've yeah. Re- yeah. Now there, yeah. there's somebody uh, in, the sign, in, the, in The Sign of the Four uh, who's really dangerous, and that is there's a South Sea Islander, I forget his name, but he's got he's got a you know, a blowgun or a blowpipe or something, and he and he kills you with poison with poison darts, uh, and 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 he's the partner of what was the, what was the main the main character's name? I mean, the Jonathan main Small. Or are you talking Jonathan about Shalto? Yeah. yeah, no, jo- Jonathan Small. He he was he was the convict. Right, yeah. who, who's who? Who come back? And, and the and the the South Sea Islander. Do you remember his name with the with the poison darts? I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't either. But that's one danger. That is one dangerous dude. And you know, and uh, um, there's a there's a complicated story. There's a, there's a treasure. That was a treasure story, as as I recall. Right, a, a, com- a complex struggle for you know for buried treasure and. Uh, the thing, that, the thing that really strikes me from the sign of the four was uh, and by the end, the bad guys have been whittled down to two, right? Jonathan Small on the South Sea Islander. Um, but they go, when, they, when the, Holmes is tracking these guys, you know, uh, relentlessly, and he tells Watson, you know, when, when, when he finds out, you know, where they are, he's, bring your revolver, right? There's, there's danger here. And, and Holmes brings a, a, a revolver also. And, you know, and then when, when when that when the islanders if he, if he raises that you know that that blow gun to his lips fire and they and he, and he they're, in, they're chasing him down the Thames right in, in in two very there's two very fast boats involved and when the when the murderer raises that that blow gun to to his lips bam 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 I mean Holmes and Watson both fire and they kill the guy but. Not before he gets a, a dart. I remember he gets a dart off. Watson says, and it goes. It went between them. Fortunately, and embedded itself in the in the wall of the boat. Or something. He's, he's otherwise one of us. You know, one one of us would have joined the killer in death. So and you see here, not just the genius of Holmes, but the physical courage of both Holmes and Watson in taking on dangerous murderers and their proficiency with uh, handguns too. You, know. you see a root here too <clears throat> for so much, so, so much other literature and so, so many other characters that have come out of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Because I think there is an obvious inspiration here for James Bond and for other similar characters. Um, in fact, you see this sort of thing happening in James Bond films. You know, one, the, the, the law chasing the bad guy in a boat down a river and there's a gunfight. Right. <laughs> Yeah, right. This you, know, you don't think of that uh, uh, 
as you know, we discussed before, it's Sherlock Holmes's genius that's so distinctive to to, the, to this corpus. And you don't think of the the shoot 'em up and the action scenes, but there, this is this is a real you know action scene. You know, the the the, the boats, the, the 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 really fast police boat chasing the really fast bad guys in a in a boat in the shootout. You know, with 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 the bad guys and the you know imminent imminent death. With the from the poison dots, uh, and, and you, yeah, you're right. This is this is this this a template for later action. You know, like the Mission Impossible scene. You can see Tom Cruise, you know, they're doing some of this daring do in the in the Mission Impossible movies. Um, you know, similar to this. Yeah, this is, there's a template here. This is also the story in which we first meet Mary Morstan. Oh, that's right, Mrs. Watson. And that's yeah, right. exactly. And um, you know, in their first encounter when she leaves. Watson says, what an attractive woman. And Holmes says, really? I didn't, I didn't observe. I didn't notice. <laughs> and so I think this is an interesting scene too to discuss because it brings up this theme of the, you know, the reason versus emotion dichotomy that, um, you know, there, there are definitely some elements of in Sherlock, but uh, yeah, I think it's what we're talking about. So it, it, after this, uh, Watson calls Holmes an automaton in a calculating machine, and Holmes responds that he simply doesn't want his judgment to be um, in, impacted by anything that's irrelevant. He says a, a client is a mere unit, uh, a factor in a problem, and that emotional qualities can be antagonistic to clear reasoning. Right. This is an important point. So, so thank you for for bringing this this up, John. Uh, you know, Holmes but is often criticized by, you know, people who are, who are objectivists or not objectivists, uh, you know, for, for what may well be this, uh, this, this reason emotion split, you know, as, as, as though, um, he's like similar to Mr. Spock, you know, in the, in the later Star Trek TV, TV show, you know, as if Holmes was sort of a Platonist, you know, and it was, you know, the mind or reason side of the split rather than the emotion or body side of the split. And Watson does describe him in that way. Uh, Conan Doyle evidently does see him in that way. And uh, to some extent, Holmes is that way. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't have uh, any interest in, 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 in women or in, or in ro romantic love. Uh, he's, he, he's generally not effusive in his uh, emotions. Although, you know, if you read carefully, if you're a careful reader, you can see how much affection he feels for Dr. Watson, you know, his, 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 his friend and, 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 and confidant. You know, he often tells him his danger, you know, he'll you know, be, be careful. I remember in the, in the, in the, in the Hound of the Baskervilles, he, he sends Watson ahead uh, for various reasons. He tells him, you know, there's danger, you be careful. You know, you can see he's concerned about his friend. But I think, you know, I mentioned the, the story, what's the name of the, I think it's the disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax. Yeah. Uh, you know, where, here yeah, I have, I, here, yeah, wait a minute, I have, John, I just happened to have here, this by coincidence. Oh, that's, that's yeah. a gorgeous single volume, okay. Ah, nice, nice, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, this is, this is the complete, the complete Sherlock Holmes in one volume, very convenient. Uh, and it's in his, it was it's in his the, the disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax is in uh, his last bow, you know that that uh, collection of, of of home stories, and uh, in it, uh, Holmes realizes that that Lady Frances Carfax is an innocent woman. She's in the grip of real villains, real bad guys. He, he suspects strongly that they're plotting to murder her. He can't, he, he's, not, he's not sure of how, of how they're going to do it. They haven't broken any laws. He can't bring the cops down on them. Uh, so he, this is the story where he breaks into the bad guy's house, right? You know, and he's looking, he's looking for evidence. He's looking for clues. Well, they, the bad guys haven't broken any laws yet, so they call the cops. <laughs> the cops, is, it's great. The villains call the cops to drag Sherlock Holmes out of, you know, <laughs> out of that. He's breaking an entry. They, they could, you know, they could arrest him for that, but they know Sherlock Holmes, so they just drag him out of the house and they, and they, let, and they let him go. But the scene I'm thinking of, so he's, you know, do, doing what Sherlock Holmes does best. He's pacing the floor. He's thinking, he's, what are the clues? How are they going to murder her? How can I, you know, you know, how can I, you know, save her, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and prevent this atrocity? And he finally figures it out, right, from the size of the coffin. 
you know, that, that right from the side is the, the size of the coffin. I think it was the clue. And, and, and he, and he, and he, he's, his, his, uh, early in the morning and, and Dr. Watson says, a fine, he's, he's been up all night. Watson's sleep at home's up all night pacing, think, thinking the problem, working the problem. Finally, just after I'd been called in the morning, he rushed into my room. He was in his dressing gown, but his pale, hollow-eyed face told me that his night had been a sleepless, sleepless one. What time is the funeral? Eight, was it not? He asked eagerly. Well, it's seven twenty now. Good heavens, Watson! What has become of any brains that God has given me? Quick, man, quick! It's life or death. A hundred chances on death to one on life. I'll never forgive myself. Never, if we are too late. It just chokes me up because you can just. You, you feel, you know, Holmes' emotion here. He's, I mean, Francis Koufax is a strange, you know, strange. I mean, this is not his sister, you know, or, or a, a, a friend of his, but she's an innocent victim of real villains. You see how he cares. You know, it, it chokes me up. You can see how much he cares about the innocent, protecting the innocent, uh, and or avenging them, you know, if, it's, if, it, if, it is, if it is too late and, and bringing the murderers to justice. And you see his emotions. You're right at the surface here. You know, and 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 it's it's unusual in the Sherlock Holmes stories to see him so uh, so worked up. But but this is what I love about Sherlock Holmes. One, he is a genius in support of innocent human life, and two, he's not a robot. He's not somebody who who who, who doesn't care. He cares about innocent human life, and that's you know, his what his, 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 Something when you really love Sherlock Holmes when you see him, you know, express his caring here for the innocent. Yeah, I, I think Arthur Conan Doyle could not have suppressed emotions in Sherlock as hard as he tried, and he really did. I think have a conscious intention to turn, at least at, at first, to to make Sherlock something of a robot. But even in the very first story, in, in a study in Scarlet. When, when Watson meets Sherlock for the very first time, you know, we, we talked about them meeting in the laboratory and Sherlock has just identified a reagent for identifying um, uh, hemoglobin so that he can tell, you know, this stain isn't just rust or, or mud. This stain is blood. Even if it's several months old, this reagent will enable him to do that. And, and he's, he's, absolutely ecstatic. I found it. I found it. He's shouting and, and walking around the laboratory and he tells them about it. And uh, Watson says that he couldn't have been more effusive if he had just won some sort of, uh, you know, international competition or something. Um, right. So right. There's, you know, right. Emotions are the result of, of one's thinking. And, uh, you know, he, he does have some bad premises. I think to some extent he, he thinks that love or, or any sort of personal emotions like that will, uh, in, in you know, bring irrelevant considerations into his ability to, to solve cases. But we mentioned earlier, I mentioned um, House, and I think that House is a really good counterpoint to Sherlock. I absolutely love House, and you know, I, I kind of agree with that. You know, the Sherlock of medicine. I think David Shore, the creator, might have even had this in mind when he created him. But House is anti-emotion in a way that makes him absolutely miserable as a person. Right. And I think there's a huge difference. I mean, Sherlock, he has this sort of ambivalence toward personal emotions that he thinks will, uh, you know, uh, corrupt his thinking. Whereas House is is almost completely anti-emotion and suffers because of it. Yeah, you know... I haven't watched TV regularly in many years. In fact, if the original Star Trek TV series of the 1960s was probably the last TV show that I watched regularly. That's more than 50 years ago. But I've dated ladies who, uh, well, one, one particular lady who uh, really liked the house. And I watched a number of episodes with her. And I was fascinated by the, you know, by the, by the series. And, and um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of points that come up. If you want to show... Uh, a character who's you know pure genius, pure intellect, and and not you know not uh, integrated to any kind of emotions. Uh, to have a criminal investigator or or uh, uh, an MD and brilliant diagnostician, they're wrong professions. Uh, 
You know, you should be, you should be like Robert Statler in, in Atlas. You should be a theoretical physicist, you know, unattached to, to as far as we could tell, as unattached as possible to real life values on Earth. Because a criminal investigator, why do you put in all this work, you know, and all this stuff? Why is he so excited about the, you know, being able to, the, the blood state, to identify blood states, except that he, 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 he wants to save innocent lives from bad guys. You know, and that means, you know, and he, and, and he cares, and Sherlock Holmes does. And the, the Lady Frances Carfax incident is one that really highlights it, but there are plenty of others. And the same for House. He cares. You know, he cares about the, the patients. He wants to save their life. Yeah, but you're right. Um, but in the, other, in the personal sides of their life, away from their professional life, Sherlock Holmes is much healthier. Because he, you can see he, he, has, he has a really good friend. In, 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 John, in John Watson, which, you know, which is uh, Dr. Watson, which, uh, you know, makes a big difference. He's, 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 got, he's got human contact. Whereas in the, in the episodes of House, I saw, he, he, he didn't, uh, you, you've seen more episodes. To the best of my knowledge, House didn't have any close friends, did he? Okay. No, he, I mean, his closest friend is another doctor he's constantly belittling. Um, you know, the, the woman that seems to care for him, he wants nothing to do with her. So it, it, he just is miserable. And he's, you know, he's on Vicodin trying to, to kill his pain. But yeah, the physical his, his pain was using Vicodin shambles. to kill. Is, is it physical pain or is he using the Vicodin to try and kill the emotional pain? Well, it's physical pain, but I guess an argument could be made that it's more than that. Okay. All right. Where, you know, Holmes, um, of course, not, not only has a, a, a close friend, but, you know, his, his passions are consumed with uh, criminal investigation. And when he has a case, he's on fire. I mean, the guy is just filled with passion. He's inexhaustible. He's indefatigable. When he's in pursuit of somebody, Watson says, he doesn't get, he doesn't get tired. He'll go days without sleep. But as soon as there's nothing, no case to stimulate him, he's just in a funk, you know, and he's he used cocaine, you know, and, and, but he's, he needs to be stimulated uh, by some case, but he, you could see he loves, yeah. you know, like Howard Rock, who says to excel at something, you, you've got to love the doing. Sherlock Holmes loves the doing. And when he's got something to do, he is not an unhappy person. He is, he is as passionate as, as, as anybody could be. And having a close friend makes a, makes a difference, which yeah, I feel for House because he does so much good in the world. He saves so many lives. This is the guy. You know, if you, if you or somebody you love has some disease that nobody else can diagnose, this is the guy. This is the guy who will figure it out, and, you know, and, 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 and save your life. But his, his own personal life just is empty. One, one thing I saw in, in the house episodes uh, was, with, I, was with that female doctor. Uh, she said to him at one point, I don't remember the context. She says to God, how she says, you, you, you're such an idiot. And House thinks about it. And he says, more of a jerk, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's exactly right. right. An idiot is somebody of low intelligence, right? Which House most definitely is not. Was a jerk is somebody who's like rude, crude, and socially unacceptable, which, uh, which House uh, often is. But yeah, I don't think anybody could accurately describe Sherlock Holmes as, as lonely. He's, 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 he's too close to Watson. You know, and they, they, they love each other. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they love each other like brothers. I mean, that's clear to me in the, in the Holmes corpus. What do, you, what do you think? Yeah, there's this beautiful, uh, beautiful scene where Watson actually get, he takes a bullet and it turns out to be a superficial wound. But he said it was worth the wound. And he said it, was, it would have been worth many wounds to know the deep loyalty that lay behind that cold mask. The clear hard eyes were dim for a moment and the firm lips were shaking. For the one and only time, I caught a glimpse of a great hurt as well as of a great brain in Sherlock, of course. All my years of humble but single-minded service culminated in that moment of revelation. Wow. Wow, I don't even remember that. So, so Holmes took a bullet for Watson? Uh, or no, 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 Watson, Watson took a bullet. Yeah. Watson took a bullet for Holmes. Yes, this was when, in one of the very la latest stories. I forget the name of it. Okay. All right. Yeah, there's a real bond here. These, these, you know, the, these, these guys are brothers. Uh, so, you know, I, there's a couple of things, that, you know, that, that, that come to my mind on this. But even, even you know, you, you wonder, you know, you know, Watson is a hero in, in his own right. You know, he's, 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 he's brave, faces death, 
a number of times with Holmes, the Hound of the Baskervilles comes to mind where, where there's this, you know, there's this fearsome huge hound ro ro roaming the moor, you know, and, and he's, he's like a monster. And uh, uh, it's, it's dangerous. In fact, the, they, both of them, again, have their guns like in, uh, uh, in, in the sign of four and they have, they have to use the guns here to, you know, uh, against the hound. You know, so Watson faces death with Holmes solidly, stolidly, bravely, and always in service of justice. You know, he's, he's a real British, uh, stiff upper lip, you know, champion of, of justice and, 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 the, and, and the good. He's horrified by crime and criminals. You know, Watson is a hero in his own right, loyal to the great man, take a bullet for him like you just, you just pointed out, tells his stories. Holmes criticizes him for embellishing it and sensationalized, making them more lurid. Than they were, but you can see he's he's touched by Watson, you know, telling his, uh, his stories, and you know, they, they Watson's a hero. They have a real bond, and we we need to be clear on that. And Watson is generally, I think, a very reliable narrator, but because he's such a good man with such a good heart. But the times I wonder if if he, you know, the, you know that literary technique of an unreliable narrator, where the mm -hmm. where the narrator can't be be trusted. Now you mentioned Edgar Allan Poe before one of the fathers of the detective story. Uh, his story, A Cask of Amontillado, is an immortal story for this, you know, because you're going along in the story and you realize by the end of the story, you know, the first person narration, you realize by the end of the story, oh my God, this guy's insane. You know, but you don't realize it until you get to the, to the end of the story. And Poe does it brilliantly. You know, he's a great writer. He does it brilliantly. And, and I wonder, you know, if, if, on this issue, if, if Watson is something of an unreliable narrator, because, <clears throat> excuse me, he's constantly describing Holmes as cold and, you know, calculating, reasoning machine, and yet the very incidents that he describes often belies that you see how much uh, Holmes actually does care. And you need to read carefully beneath the, the, the obvious descriptions to the actions of the man. And you see, no, Holmes is not cold. He's, 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 he cares about innocent human life. He cares a lot. It's part of his heroism. It's why he's in this business in the first place. It's not just, you know, it's not chess. You know, it's not just, and I'm not the, the meaning chess here. It's, it's a great game. But it's a game. It's an intellectual game. Uh, this is life and death, literally. He cares. You know about innocent life. That's why he's. That's why he's a, a grandmaster of criminal detection, not a grandmaster. The the, the 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 ultimate grandmaster of criminal detection, not not the greatest chess player in history, the greatest detective in history. Yeah, he says at some point, I I abhor the dull routine of existence and I crave for mental exaltation, and I think that this captures better, uh, you know, Sherlock in in his own words than this, this reason emotion split. I mean, of course, he gives voice to that as well. But the thing that he's most concerned about in life, the thing that he most loves is to be thinking and to be coming up with solutions to difficult problems. Um, and I think this is what, I, I think this is the most powerful lesson from Sherlock that we can apply in our own lives. He says, it is a capital mistake to theorize uh, before one has data because insensibly, one begins to twist the facts to suit the theories instead of the theories to suit the facts. You know, every time I uh, read Sherlock or watch one of the movies, I'm just uh, overwhelmed with this desire to be a more uh, rational, fact-oriented person. And of course, this doesn't mean that I, uh, I turned a blind eye to my, my emotional reactions to things, but it, it does really heighten my own awareness of uh, my my thinking and my ability to conceptualize the things around me and really in, inspires me to to think better and to think more scientifically as Holmes did. Right. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. I have that on my list here. There's something, that, that's a must. That's a must here for, you know, uh, for a show, hero worshiping Sherlock Holmes, his fact orientation. He says, he says that, over and over again, you know, in the, in the, in the corpus of, of his stories, um, evidence first, facts first, you know, you, we don't feel, don't theorize like, like you said, because then we'll find ourselves trying to, you know, to mold the facts to fit the theory rather than develop the theory to, to, to fit the facts. 
And yeah, yes, he's very inductive in, in, that, in that regard, beautifully, brilliantly indu in, inductive. That is, we extract the explanatory principle from the evidence. We, we, get, we, get, we derive the theory from, from the evidence. And so, yeah, he's, he's, he is ruthless. In, in that kind of fact orientation, very, very objective. That's, that's what objective means. It means oriented towards the object, you know, towards the facts out here in the, out here in, in the world. That's what makes him such a brilliant thinker. And of course, you know, some of the displays of this are, are hilariously funny when he, he confounds people, Watson, Watson over and over again. Watson portrays himself a little bit as, as a little bit of a, of a, 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 a dunce in contrast to Holmes, because years after, you know, seeing Holmes, you know, his technique, he's still like confounded. How did you do that? You know, and, you know, and uh, it's hilarious at times when Holmes will look at somebody and, and for the first time in five seconds, he'll tell, he'll tell what, what, what profession you're in, where you live, you know, what you did on Thursday. You know, and I go, guys, what? how did you do that? That's all true. How do you, how do you know that? Um, and, you know, uh, Conan Doyle says, you know, that, that, what, that Holmes is deducing this. I think, I think what Holmes, in the technical terms of logic, is literally doing is inducing it. He's, he's pulling these, these uh, details and these, and, and these, uh, uh, these characterizations, f you know, f from the particulars. You know, move, moving from the particulars to more general conclusion about about these characters, but you know, he, he's, 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 a, he's a brilliant inducer. Some of the particular cases they, sh you know, they showed Watson shows in the stories are, are a bit fanciful, but nevertheless, you know, highlighting what a brilliant inducer uh, uh, Holmes is. And what does he say at one point uh, to Watson and maybe the other characters, he said, says, I don't remember the exact words, but he says to the effect, you see the same facts that I see. Right, but you don't perform the the inference. You don't. You don't. You, you don't see, make. But you do not observe. Right, right. You see, but you do not observe. You see, but you do not understand. You see the same facts I see, but you're not pulling the inference. You know that, that that's warranted uh, from the facts. And you know, and Holmes is is not just the smartest guy in the room. Always meaning the most intelligent guy. He's always, like you're pointing out here, John, he's always the most objective, most rational guy in the room. His yeah. method is so I, clean. His method is so clean. I think he's a master of both induction and deduction, if you think about it, because he does go from the particular to the general, but he also knows so much about the general that he's able to then tie right. that back and apply it to the particular. This is a guy that's written monographs and can tell at a sight every form of ash or he, he can identify the yeah, right. maker of every, every cigar and, and uh, cigarette just by the ash. Um, you know, he's written monographs on deciphering footprints uh, and he can tell, you know, what someone's stride is just from the, the footprints in the mud or something. Right. So he, he's doing right. both. Yeah, right. you're, you're right. You're right. Because he, a, a further example of that is he knows and often makes reference to every criminal case <laughs> that has been perpetrated for like the last 150 years across the entire continent of Europe. He says, well, it's similar. There were three cases similar to this. In 1827, there was the Treploff murder in Kiev. You know, you, you know what, you know, what? He's, like, he's like a walking encyclopedia of, uh, you know, of true crime stories. And he could take all of that knowledge which is generalized knowledge of, you know, of, of criminal actions and then apply it to this specific case. So that's, and that's deductive reasoning. You know, yeah, so you're, you're exactly right. Holmes the master. You know, this is, this is why we love, this is why we love him. You know, anybody who's a hero worshiper, part of what we love about heroes is their mastery, you know, their dominance and, you know, in service of the good. And Holmes has both those qualities in full measure, right? He's, he's the dominant uh, thinker in any criminal case. And uh, it's always in service of the good, in protecting the innocent, or at the very least, uh, bringing the perpetrators to justice. This is what we love, I think, most about Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, he puts his great mind to uh, attaining life-serving values, to getting justice, to uh, kid, uh, per getting the perpetrators, getting the criminals behind bars, to helping the innocent, 
saving their lives. Um, you know, we, we've mentioned a couple of times his powers of observation. And we also mentioned, I think briefly that Holmes was based largely on Arthur Conan Doyle's Edinburgh medical professor, Joseph Bell. And, you know, Conan Doyle was, when he was at school at, at Edinburgh, he was the outpatient clerk for Joseph Bell. So he'd have to interview patients and ask them several questions and take down their answers. Then he'd show them into the room and just within seconds, Joseph Bell would know more than he did. There was uh, one story that he retells where a patient comes in and just uh, asking questions one after another w- within a few seconds. He asks, so you were in the army? The guy says, yes. You were in a Highland regiment? The guy says, yes. You're a, a non-commissioned officer, right? Yeah. And, and you were stationed in Barbados. Yes. <laughs> and all this just by uh, just the rapid appreciation of a few small points of detail. And so this, um, you know, well, I think while we're appreciating the, the heroism of Sherlock Holmes, we should also appreciate his, uh, his progenitor, Joseph Bell, who apparently also was involved in consulting on some crimes, by the way, and uh, gave his, his detailed report of the Jack the Ripper murders to Scotland Yard. Oh, is that right? Okay. Wow. I didn't know that. That's well. That's that's great information, John, about uh, the the brilliant MD who served as the inspiration, as as Arthur Conan Doyle's inspiration for for Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it shows that in real life, this can be done. You can induce all kinds of information from from uh, a few observational details. Well, so I, um, before we wrap this up. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. You know, in 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 all of the 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 great Sherlock Holmes stories, do you have a favorite of uh, of of any of them that really that you really love and 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 that's really vivid in your mind? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I, I definitely like a scandal in Bohemia because Irene we, we meet Irene Adler. Yeah, it's probably one of my favorites. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, you know, there's there's a, a few a few of them. But before I answer that question, reminds me you reminded me uh, one of the stories. You know, there's many. I think it was fifty something or sixty something, all all told. And at various times in my life, I've you know I've read them, uh, the complete uh, Sherlock Holmes stories. But it's been like I don't know twelve years or so since I read the the complete corpus. This may inspire me to go reread the whole thing again. But there's one of those stories which I can't remember which one. Um, but some guy says to him, I want, I want to hire you, Mr. Holmes, because it's said of you that you've never been beaten. You know, and, and Holmes says to him, I don't remember the exact numbers he says, but he says something like, he says, no, he says, I've been beaten four times in my life, three times by a man and once by a woman. You know, he's, so, <laughs> he's so honest and he's so exact. You know, he's, and one time by a woman, of course, is, Irene, is, is the Scandal of Bohemia uh, story of Irene Adler that, that you mentioned. Um, the Speckled Band, so imaginative, you know, where the murderer who's, who's a doctor and he's, he's, he's using this snake, this venomous snake who slithers through, you know, the ventilator shaft from room to room and down the pull cord, you know, to, to kill the victims. And uh, again, there's danger. There's danger there, you know, and Holmes realizes it. I don't remember if, I think, well, I think he probably told Watson to have his, 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 his gun. Uh, but, but, um, uh, that, that's the story where, where Holmes says to Watson, he says, when doctors go bad, he said, they make the most dangerous villains because they know so much, you know, have so much medical knowledge, know so much about biology and chemistry and different ways to kill their victims that won't show up, you know, in a, in a forensic uh, examination. So Speckled Band is a, is a great story, imaginative. And also the Red-Headed League, you know, <laughs> well, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, they, they, the bad guys make up this league of, of redheaded men. Who was, so there's some redheaded guy who was left a benefactor. And all, the, the whole point is to get him out of the office so that they could tunnel, you know, they could <laughs> tunnel into, into, into a bank. 
<laughs> you know, and the oh, bizarre and, scheme. <laughs> yeah, and, and and imaginative, but not imaginative enough because when they tunnel up into the bank vault, well, who do they find waiting for them? But Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson and Scotland Yard. But but yeah, I love um, Arthur Conan Doyle's imaginativeness. Those two stories, I think, highlight highlight it very well. So, but but I can't. I can't remember reading any any Sherlock Holmes story where I wasn't where I wasn't fully engaged, you know, in the in in the story. Yeah, and for that matter, any of the movies or TV shows that have that have come of it, I particularly love the BBC version of Sherlock. I think it's you know Benedict Cumberbatch is an excellent Sherlock. Uh, it's a little darker than some of the others. I, I recall um, you know the episode with the cabbie that's that's playing off of uh, studying Scarlet, very very dark. But um, it just absolutely brilliant, great acting, and they they make the stories uh, they make the stories real, and they update them. They you know they bring them into our time. Our yeah, there's so many different there's so many different iterations. There's the old Hollywood films with Basil Rathbone, you know, that I saw when I was a, you know on TV when I was a kid. I could I could barely I could barely remember. And then there's then there's a story. You know, there there was a story 1980s. I think wasn't that a story by the young of the young Sherlock Holmes and was there, was there a movie version of Sherlock Holmes in love? I, uh, I'm trying, I think, and uh, then there was recently, there was the old Sherlock Holmes when he was a beekeeper and he was like 80 something, 80 something years old. They see the fascination people have. And then there was the guy Richie version with uh, Robert Downey, mm -hmm. who as our good friend, a friend of the show, Robert Begley said to me, Somewhat, you know, he was he was fairly negative about it. He said, you know, uh, Robert Downey portrayed Sherlock Holmes the same way he portrayed Tony Stark, you know, uh, as this kind of wastrel kind of kind of guy. Still, which is true. Still, there was a there was a you know a lighthearted sense to it, you know, and, and there was always the respectful all the all the different versions I've seen uh, in the in the movies and the Benedict Cumberbatch series that that you reference. They always have the reverence for Sherlock Holmes genius. He's always the smartest guy in the room. I, what I didn't like in the Guy Ritchie versions is if I remember correctly, they kill off I, Irene Adler. Is it, doesn't Professor Moriarty murder her in those? In, in yeah, I think you're right. It's been a while since I've seen those, but uh, that does sound right. Yeah, well, I didn't like that at all. But, you know, still, you could see the fascination with that, that, um, millions of people still have with Sherlock Holmes, you know, 130 years later. And, and I think after the discussion we've just had for the last 40, 50 minutes, uh, I think the, the, you know, the, the viewers of the hero show, if they haven't read Sherlock Holmes, I think they'll see why anybody who wants a sight of heroism, you know, and a sight of human greatness, uh, you can't do better than reading the, the Sherlock Holmes stories. He towers over the landscape as literature's most singular man. Absolutely. Yeah. Start, dive in, you know, get the, get the collected works. You're going to want to read them all. So just, just start at the beginning. I'll, there are also some great audible versions. You can listen to uh, Benedict Cumberbatch does some of them. Um, I, I couldn't tell you the name of the narrator that I've got for the collected works, but it's excellent. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. That's a good thing. It's a good point, Sean, because these days a lot of people, either they're not readers or they don't have time. Don't have the time they would like to to read. But the, the audible books, you know, you could you could use you could listen to them when you're driving in the car. People listen to books. You know, listen to the books when they're doing housework or yard work or you know or or on the treadmill. You know, and they're in the, they're in the gym exercising. So yeah, yeah, I get my pulse rate up if I'm on you know <laughs> if, if I'm on the recumbent bike. And Holmes and Watson are in hot pursuit of some of some murderer. This is this is this is great stuff. And I think before we sign off, John, uh, this is I I I I'm hoping that many of our viewers who you know the the people who tune in regularly to the Hero Show are obviously hero worshippers. And I hope you know, you know you and I intend this uh, as a Christmas present to to the audience because you know this 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 Friday when the show airs is Christmas day so we mean this as a as as a christmas gift to our audience and and the gift is really benign you know, fully benign if for for people who haven't read Sherlock Holmes or haven't read him in many years 
read for the first time or reread any any of these these Sherlock Holmes stories because he is a towering literary hero. And I think for us, you and I, John, I think the perfect choice for our first fictional hero. First fictional hero and uh, hopefully a good Christmas gift for everybody. It's certainly been fun for us. Merry Christmas to our, our hero work, our fellow hero worshipers. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, I wish I had a Santa Claus, you know, hat <laughs> and, and a beard and everything. Merry, but, but Merry Christmas, fellow hero worshipers. Have a great, uh, have a great heroic Christmas. Love your Sherlock Holmes because he is a towering hero. And John, I'm going to wish you a more heroic day and a very heroic Christmas for you and your lovely bride. So I'm going to salute Conan as well, Sherlock Holmes, and Dr. Watson, and have a have a heroic day, my my good friend. Mm-hmm.